Thank Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Thanks so much. It's great to be here with you all. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, Mr. President, members of the legislature and fellow citizens, together we have made Florida the freest state in these United States. While so many around the country have consigned the people's rights to the graveyard, Florida has stood as freedom's vanguard. In Florida, we have protected the right of our citizens to earn a living, provided our businesses with the ability to prosper, fought back against unconstitutional federal mandates, and ensured our kids have the opportunity to thrive. Florida has become the escape hatch for those chafing under authoritarian, arbitrary, and seemingly never-ending mandates and restrictions. Even today, across the nation, we see students denied an education due to reckless, politically motivated school closures, workers denied employment due to heavy-handed mandates, and Americans denied freedoms due to a co coercive biomedical apparatus. These unprecedented policies have been as ineffective as they have been destructive. They are grounded more in blind adherence to Faucian declarations than they are in the constitutional traditions that are the foundation of free nations. Florida is a free state. We reject the biomedical security state that curtails liberty, ruins livelihoods, and divides our society. And we will protect the rights of individuals to live their lives free from the yoke of restrictions and mandates. Florida has stood strong as the rock of freedom, and it is upon this rock that we must build Florida's future. Now, fortunately, we're going to be able to confront our challenges with an incredibly favorable budget outlook and with strong economic performance that has withstood unfavorable national headwinds. My recommended budget of $99.7 billion has more than $15 billion in reserves, one of the largest surpluses in the history of our state. Florida's revenues have exceeded estimates by billions of dollars over the past year and a half, and December's revenues came in at more than $500 million over the latest monthly estimate. And this is all being done with no income tax and the lowest per capita tax burden in the United States. Job creation in Florida is far exceeding the national average, and our labor force has increased six times faster than the nation's as a whole. We also lead the nation 
in business formations, which have increased by 61% since I took office in 2019. And in 2021, Florida has already seen 114,000 more new businesses than second place California, even though California has a population that is 40% larger than ours. Freedom works. So we're really excited to be here. We have a great announcement today, and uh, we'll be doing some uh, financial awards for a few communities in North Florida, but obviously wanted to come here uh, to Madison County to be able to do the one that'll be in this county. I have our DEO secretary, Dane Eagle, is here with me, who's been really helping us do a lot. Uh, we have Representative Schof, Payne, and Brannon that are here. Uh, Senator Jennifer Bradley is here, and then we have uh, Shamiria Roberson, who was our Deputy uh, Health Secretary for, uh, for two years uh, and is a native of Madison County. So we want to thank Shamiria. You know, you look around like Florida, we're um, in, in really good shape. I think we're in the legislative session. I got to make sure these guys come through with some of the stuff that I'll be saying. But we're going to end up with a uh, really massive budget surplus. Uh, a lot of people didn't think that a couple years ago. We lead the nation in new business formations, and the business formations in Florida are up 61% just since I became governor in 2019. And so you see that, and you see a lot of energy and a lot of dynamism uh, that's going on. In fact, we had, uh, in 2021, 114,000 more new businesses than California, but California is almost twice our size. And so uh, that's showing you uh, that we've got a lot of good stuff going on. 2021 was the record in Florida's history for domestic tourism in terms of people coming to Florida. And so you see, that's right, that's right. But it's true, people know, no one wants to travel internationally because you gotta get tested and all this. And just think about it, you may get caught in a foreign country they do one of these PCR tests, they find dead virus from like a month ago, and you're not even sick, contagious, and then what, you have to isolate for two weeks in a foreign country? So people don't want to go through the hassle, but they also know that not every place in America can you just go and live like a free person. Some places will discriminate against you based on your medical history. Other places will impose mandates, restrictions, and they know in Florida, you're going to be in a free state. You're going to be able to do and live if you're visiting or living the way you want to do it. So, yes, we had almost 120 million Americans escape from Fauciville to come to free Florida. So, yes. And we're, um, you know, we're really excited about being here today. We've put a big emphasis on uh, support for infrastructure in our rural communities. Uh, the way I view it is a lot of times, you know, that can go an awful long way. You, know, you can bring some stuff to, to certain parts of Florida, and that could be helpful. But we really have made a, a big impact across the board and what we've been able to do uh, to a lot of counties, particularly our counties in North Florida, but really throughout the, um, throughout the state. So today, we're going to be awarding $11 million for rural communities throughout North Florida uh, through our Rural Infrastructure Fund. Uh, that legislation you're talking about? It's, it's, she just got a letter from the Agency for Persons with Disabilities. Can you, show, can you show me the letter I so we can look at it? The letter, but yeah. what would you tell this mother? Well, I want to see it. I mean, you know, what happens is, you know, we any, if there's a bureaucratic issue, you know, we, we want to come in and, and, and try to help people out. And so if you get that to us, we will absolutely work. I know the legislature is working on different things. You know, we've had issues. I mean, there's been a huge increase in Medicaid, of course. Uh, but the reimbursements are low, so those are going to go up because it's harder to get people. And
and folks need care. So you're going to see, I think, some, some, some issues with the legislature in terms of that. But that particular case, if you get us that, uh, I will talk to the agency and we'll see what we can do. Bill is on the floor of the Senate today. I spoke with Senate President Wilton Simpson over the summer. He's a big supporter of this $8 million for a long-acting contraception program. A lot of health experts and doctors feel like that's the best way to cut down on abortions is by reducing unwanted pregnancies. I'm wondering if you agree with that approach and if you plan to veto that program as you did last year. Um, I don't recall the, uh, that, to be honest with you, so I'd have to look uh, and see and get back to you. Um. Is there any parts of it you did agree with that you heard? Um, you know, I mean, I think uh, um, I, I have to think about um, some of the stuff. Well, I mean, I agree. You know, if you think about what they've done, Fauci is in the witness protection program now. They don't want him out. They, no, they, they've never supported any. If you, if you listen to them, they never supported all these policies that were so destructive. Now it's like, you know, we all want to be like Florida all of a sudden, and nothing has changed. There's been no change in the underlying science. The ineffectiveness of those policies was apparent long ago. The destructiveness of those policies was apparent long ago, and they were the ones that were dipping their nose into Florida's business last summer saying that two-year-old kids needed to be forced masks when they leave the house, saying that school children had to wear masks for eight hours a day. Now they act like that was something they didn't support and they're saying that you don't do it. They actually said two weeks ago that everyone at the, at the speech had to have an N95 mask. Then they changed it. How did the science change in two weeks? It changed, it didn't change, they changed that because they knew it would be a terrible visual to have all these people there suffering in mass, socially distant, while the rest of the country is out living their lives. And so I'm glad that I think it was because of politics. I don't think this was a, a legitimate conversion. I think they're getting negative polling, and I think most Americans associate these never-ending restrictions with their administration and, and like-minded governors and mayors. And it's interesting because for every governor or mayor that takes restrictive action, mandate, lockdown, almost all say, you know, critical of Florida, how many of them end up on vacation in Florida over the last year, year and a half? And there's a lot, and there's a lot that many of you know, but I can tell you there's even more that haven't been made public because people tell me these things because, you know, they work at, they work at like a you know, resort, and they're like, wait a minute, that, if I was working in their state, I'd have been shut down, and yet they come down here, and they're enjoying all this stuff. So I'm glad that they have pivoted off of it. Um, I think it's been really damaging, and I think you're going to continue to see problems with, um, with what we're seeing with, with some of the school children, how they were treated in a lot of these different parts of the country. I mean, can you imagine, like, you're in Chicago or Los Angeles or some of these places, and you can't get your kid in school for the entire year last year? Or you'd go in one day a week, and then forget about the, the, all the mitigation once you're in school. But that is a huge, huge thing. That's going to have huge ramifications far into the future. And, uh, and, and they were responsible for doing that. We stood up for kids in Florida. We stood up for parents. We stood up for education because we thought it was important. Um, and I think our kids are going to be much better off than a lot of these kids in these other states. And you know, even to that day last night, you have them saying no mask in the Capitol, which I support. But then they're still forcing kids in, in elementary school in certain parts of the country uh, to do this. And so I'm glad that the conversion has happened. I don't think it's necessarily genuine. I think it's more driven by political science. But here's, I think, the stakes for just people in Florida and throughout the country. You know, once we get through that midterm election, um, I think people that are of that mindset will probably look to clamp down again. And so the only way you could be sure that your freedoms are going to be uh, respected is to make sure that you're supporting people who have a demonstrative record, demonstrated a record of actually supporting your freedoms. Yes, sir. Could you address the crisis in Ukraine and how the president is handling it, and is there anything you would do differently if you were in Well, I said the other day that if you look at what's going on in someone like Vladimir Putin, you know, I analogize him to basically an authoritarian gas station attendant. If you look at their country, it's a hollowed-out country 
but for the energy. And yes, they have neg legacy nuclear weapons, which makes them much more, much more dangerous than if they didn't have those. And so he's in a situation where um, his ideology, I think, is try to reassemble some of the lost glory uh, of what they had. Now, the Soviet Union was not a glorious uh, entity. I mean, this was one of the most evil regimes in, in modern, uh, modern history, and the result was a lot of deaths because of Soviet communism and Chinese communism in the 20th century. But his view is that the dissolution of the Soviet Union was a bad thing, and so he's being fueled because America is not serious about energy independence right now, and Europe is not serious at all. So Europe is funding this guy, so he has the ability now uh, to go in and flex muscle. We, when I was in Congress under President Trump, we uh, funded a lot of weapons for Ukraine uh, to be able to defend themselves. Uh, I think that that has helped them uh, put up a fight. I think that they've done better than a lot of people thought. Uh, nevertheless, they're putting a lot of uh, a, a lot of machinery, a lot of uh, heavy equipment inside that country, you know, that's going to be very difficult, um, you know, for, for Ukraine to keep at bay uh, indefinitely. However, what I think is going to end up happening is you're going to end up with, like, these Ukrainians engaging in guerrilla warfare, and I think it's going to be like death by a thousand cuts, and so I think Putin is miscalculated, but if you want to hold Putin accountable, the way to do it is hit him where it hurts, hit him with the energy, but in order to do that, America, we would need to reverse the policies that Biden's put in place. We'd have to re get Keystone back online. We'd have to do ANWR. We'd have to do production on federal lands. That will then get us to where we were, where we could be independent of Russian oil um, and be able to have a lot of leverage uh, to use um, against them in this. But if you're not willing to do that, I mean, some of these sanctions – Maybe they'll have an impact. We'll see. We'll see how it how it all shakes out. Um, I think a lot of the international opinion has really gone against Putin in ways that he didn't quite anticipate. So, so it may have an impact. But if you hit him on energy, uh, you know that would be a crippling blow, and those oligarchs wouldn't like it. And Putin, you know, he's propped up by the oligarchs. And so, if the oligarchs lose confidence in him, then he would really be, I think, in a very difficult situation. Um, but th at the end of the day. Uh, you know, this is a guy that is very aggressive, and I believe that the decision to go into Ukraine was one that was probably made last summer as he's watching what was happening in Afghanistan and the failed um, American, uh, you know, how Biden handled that. I think he sized that up. I think President Xi in China is sizing that up. I think the Ayatollah in Iran is sizing that up. And so I said you're going to have a lot of turmoil over the next three, three and a half years, and unfortunately that's being proven correct. Um, but hitting him where it hurts is really what you need to do to be able to, um, uh, to, to, to really show that this was a, a, a big error in judgment. I think he miscalculated anyways. Um, I don't think this is going to work out for him the way that he wanted to. And, you know, when you see people that are willing to fight, I mean, it's inspiring to see these people just grab rifles who are civilians and going out there and fighting uh, to ward off uh, a Russian army. Uh, a lot of other places around the world, they just fold the minute there's any type of adversity. I mean, can you imagine if he went into France, would they do anything to put up a fight? Probably not. Um, and so those folks, um, you know, are stepping up, but it's a, there's a lot of problems, I think, between now and then. And I think, unfortunately, it's going to end up very, very ugly um, over the next uh, weeks and months. Okay, thank you, guys. Appreciate it. other stuff and so they were able to radio in you got the help the, the navy one of the helos scooped him up and sa saved the guy's life so uh e embry riddle does a great but just shows you they got a lot of good kids here so thank you for doing that i want to recognize a lot of great folks who are with us here today uh, we have our commissioner of education richard corcoran here we have the president of the Florida Senate um, who helped shepherd this bill through, uh, Wilton Simpson. We have Representative Sam Garrison from Clay County, Webster Barnaby from uh, close by. Um, 
Tom Leak, who's close. Is this, is this your district or is that better hop? It is now. Okay. <laughs> All right. So we've got, um, we've got uh, Representative Leak and Federhoff uh, from, from Volusia County, which we're proud of them. Tyler Soroy from uh, Brevard County. And then we have Senators Tom Wright and Jason Broder. So thank you, guys. And we have two parents who are going to discuss this legislation, uh, Rebecca Sarwi from Volusia County and Alicia Farron from Orange County. So I want to thank them for being here today. We've been able to do an awful lot in education. When I came in, one of the first things we did uh, with uh, working with Commissioner Corcoran was eliminate Common Core. Uh, we thought that that was something important. And you see the fruition of that, not just with uh, the standards that we now have in, in Florida, but also the elimination of the FSA, which is really tied to Common Core. We're now going to progress monitoring. Uh, if you look at what we've been able to do to expand educational choice, not just with, with private scholarships, but also uh, with charter schools, parents in Florida, regardless of income level, have meaningful choice when it comes to the education of their kids. And so we're really, we're really proud of that. We're also very proud of having schools open when many places weren't having them open. And this was just a situation where we either had to do what was right for the kids or just subcontract out everything to Fauci. And we were not willing to do that in Florida. You know, people like Fauci were wrong. They wanted these schools closed indefinitely. You had schools closed for over a year in other parts of the country. We were not going to let that happen. So we said every single parent in Florida has the right to send their kid to school in person five days a week. And we were the only big state that was saying that at the time in the summer of 2020. And if you look at what's happened since, uh, the massive learning losses in the areas that closed schools and wouldn't let the kids in, uh, it was very difficult for parents. And so we were able to, to navigate uh, that in a much, much better way. And it's not necessarily easy, but I guarantee you, uh, we would have been way, way worse off if we had listened to a lot of the critics and the naysayers um, and kept that out. So we did that, uh, and that was really uh, something that was very important to the students, but also to the parents. We got a lot of working parents. Uh, you, you can't be uh, put food on the table and have to teach school all day. It was very difficult for a lot, particularly a lot of our, our single moms, and so it helped stabilize a lot of family situations as well in addition to the academic benefits and so we were proud of that and then you know we passed last year a parents bill of rights and part of that was you shouldn't let the school districts force mask these kids all day in school and so we felt very strongly about that we did an executive order last summer saying that you know parents are free to to do that if they want to i as a parent would not do that but that's fine i mean it's a free country but you cannot force these kids to suffer under these masks for eight hours a day. And so we were able to lead on that. You know, we had some folks fight. We, we won all, all those fights. Um, and we're much better off as a result of giving kids the freedom to breathe in school. So we're happy that we were able to do that. But I think one of the things that happened with, with COVID and you had more parents now kind of having to be teachers, like in Florida, obviously we had the schools open, but you still had periods of remote in the, in the spring of 2020. And then in other parts of the country, this was like all the standard where they were doing it. So parents became exposed more to what was actually going on um, in some of the schools. And so they became more uh, interested in making sure that one, their kids weren't being forced to do things like mass and they go to school board meetings, which is obviously important, uh, but also, Parents want education for their kids. They're not interested in indoctrination uh, through the school system. And that's where... Well, we're, we're excited about being able to deliver yet again. You know, when you come in, a lot of people do, you know, these politicians will make uh, all these promises and then they always either just under-deliver or total, totally fail to deliver. Uh, here, we set 
really, really high standards and high goals. And not only did we meet them, we've exceeded them. And so that's really what it's all about, being able to actually get this stuff done. I mean, we've got more to do, but for where we said we would be three and a half years ago, we're ahead of, ahead of where we said we would be. And I think a lot of people are really excited about that. And you're seeing a difference uh, for sure. We were just down in Southwest Florida. I mean, these guys are doing great fishing. The restaurants are, are fantastic uh, in terms of, uh, I think they had a record year in 2021, a lot of them were telling me, and they're up 15% in 2022. And so it's, uh, it's a great thing. And, you know, part of that obviously is uh, being good stewards of, of the environment, making sure people want to come here and visit, but part of it is just making sure these places could be open. You know, a lot of people were criticizing me because we had these places open and we saved tens of thousands of jobs in that industry alone. Um, and those were people, you know, if we had thrown them to the wolves like Fauci wanted, uh, you would have ended up seeing so many people plunged into destitution. And a lot of these family owned restaurants and businesses would have just simply gone under. And so not only did that not happen and we protected these folks, a lot of them have never done better uh, in the history of their businesses. And so that's what we want to see. Okay, uh, question or two? Who would you rather have, Latipo or Fauci? <laughs> okay, ACA Secretary Simone Marsteller. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So, ladies and gentlemen, what you've heard today, you should be hearing a lot of frustration. We're also going to continue to work very hard on education, yes, workforce education, but just the fact, if you think about it, uh, that we work so hard to have the kids in school this whole time, you're going to see when they do these state-by-state -state results for the nation's report card uh, that, that we will have done so much better than these lockdown states uh, with, with our kids' performance because you just can't learn right being on Zoom for a year and a half. It doesn't work that way. So we thought that that was very important. I had a lot of opposition when we were doing that back in 2020. And you know, you see somebody like Fauci now, and he's saying he never supported closing schools. He's actually saying that. That is just false. He attacked me for having schools open. Are you kidding me? But I think the fact that he's saying that, the fact that he claims he never advocated lockdowns, even though he criticized Florida, and actually said so the summer of 2020, uh, we, you know, we had COVID wave, first being COVID wave, and people are telling me, close the state. I had a letter written to me from all the Democrat members of the U.S. Congress in mid-July saying, you must shut down Florida. I rejected that. I kept it open and yeah. and but when they were doing it, he was saying that 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 Florida needed to do this as well, or saying that they really need to think about doing that. And so but the fact that he's now rewriting history, you know, what that tells us is that's his way He's never going to admit he was wrong, but that's their way of kind of distancing themselves from the catastrophic damage that those policies inflicted on people throughout this country. Uh, you cannot look at the learning loss that we see in states like California and Chicago and all these other places and say that that was somehow good. Uh, because you can look at states like Florida and you can look at other states and see they had the kids in school. And so how are you going to be able to rationalize that? They cannot rationalize it. But the danger is they're not admitting that they're wrong and so that's something that they may be willing to do again in the future. And so that's why when I saw this thing with the CDC adding COVID shots to the childhood immunization schedule, uh, they are doing that and that is going to be a pretext for states throughout this country to mandate that on school children. Some already do. D.C. is trying to do it. Some of the California is trying to do it. And, and I saw this as something that was likely uh, to be a push at some point. So I had the legislature ban mandates for school children in the state of Florida for COVID shots. 
That's your decision as a parent. Uh, but I think that uh, we've served in Florida as really a beacon of hope for a lot of people throughout our country and really throughout the world. I've had people write into me. I've had people write into me from Australia, New Zealand, writing into our office talking about how it's really been tough times in some of those areas because their rights were basically eviscerated and how here in Florida, you know, we were standing up for people. You know, we fought the machine. We fought uh, people like Dr. Fauci. You know he's now saying that he never supported closing schools. He's actually trying to say that. And he said he never supported lockdowns. That's what he's now saying. Even though he was always criticizing us for doing uh, open business and, and schools being open. So, so you have that. Uh, but part of, I think, the reason uh, that, that we're a free state is because we are protecting people against indoctrination by woke ideology. We can't let woke ideology take over every institution in our society. And so Florida, we're fighting back on all fronts. So the whole Disney thing, you know, was, was yeah, that bill was important, uh, but it's also just setting the parameters um, about who governs society and governs our state. And I think we made it clear that, uh, yes, we view woke ideology as a threat in the legislature by leftist politicians, of course. We view it as a threat with some of these local leftist politicians who are in try to do it. But we also understand we're not just going to sit idly by if a corporation is trying to impose a woke agenda on our state. We're going to fight back on all fronts, and we're going to make sure we preserve for you uh, breathing space so you can think and act the way you want to, regardless of what the elites say. So you can count on that. So the questions are, uh, are you going to stand strong over the next few weeks till we bring this home? Are you going to rustle up some votes from your friends and your family and your neighbors? Are you going to make sure that we do, I don't know about Orange County, but the whole Central Florida area, we are going to do. Are you ready to make sure that we keep Florida free? Thank you. Thank you so much. Are you going to vote so we can keep it that way? And when you do that, will you help me send a tired, worn out old donkey out to pasture once and for all? We love Northwest Florida. We love seeing y'all. I know we got some folks here. Was Congressman Dunn here? Where are these guys at? We got Neil Dunn. Is this still your district? Ten feet outside his district. Okay. Then we have your next senator, Jay Trumbull. Your uh, state representative, outgoing, Brad Drake is here. Where's he at? There's Brad. And then incoming representative, Shane Abbott. And then House District 3 is going to be Joel Rudman. Where's he at? Is he here? All right, he's close by. How many of you have moved to Florida in the last four years since I've been governor? How many of you who did raise your hand, raise your hand if you would have moved if I had not been elected governor and the other guy won, would you still have moved? No. How many of you that have been here a while, if I had not won that election, how many of you may have moved somewhere else? I mean, you know. But, you know, it's, it's important because what you've seen over the last few years You've seen different states be able to handle different issues differently, and obviously we all had to deal with COVID in one way or another. And I could just tell you this, you go back to the summer of 2020, I had every Democrat member of the Florida delegation in the U.S. House write me a letter 
They wrote me a letter saying, oh, you're being reckless. We can't have business open. You need to lock down the state of Florida. You need to force everybody to shelter in place. That's what they told me to do. So uh, I looked at the letter, and look, it wasn't just them. I mean, I was getting hammered by the media and the left and all that stuff, saying that we were doing, doing everything so wrong. So I, I got, look, I, I read the letter. I started uh, you know, processing that, and I crumpled up the letter and threw it in the trash. Because I knew... If I had done what they wanted to do, it would have destroyed this state. It would have thrown millions of people's lives into turmoil. It would have cost hundreds and hundreds of thousands of jobs, and it would have killed thousands and thousands of small businesses, and our kids would have had no opportunities to even go to school. It would have been like a mini California. And it's interesting because now you got all those people who were uh, attacking me and against me, they now all claim that they wanted to do this all along. Everything Florida did, they were wanting to do it. Even Fauci is saying. <laughs> Fauci is saying, I never said schools should be closed. That's what he's saying. I, he never supported lockdown. Well, um, I can tell you, uh, we can't let them rewrite history because with the, the stand that Florida took, being a, a citadel of freedom for this country, uh, it was an important stand. It was a stand that has shaped the future of our state in ways that, that we are seeing each and every day with uh, the, the investment in Florida, our 2.5% unemployment rate, second lowest on record, our record budget surplus of $22 billion. And the schools, if you look, they actually, there's only one test for, for K-12 that every state does, and this has started decades ago. It's called the National Assessment for Education Progress. They call it the nation's report card, and they actually on Monday released the first state-by-state -state results since COVID. And Florida, on that, all 50 states, we ranked for Fourth grade reading, number three in the country, and for fourth grade math, number four in the country. And, and, it, and if you adjust for demographics, we are number one in the nation in both by far. And so that would not have happened. That would not have happened if we had let uh, the left and the media have their way uh, and lock the kids out of school, like they did in many of these other places. And, no, and I had to make a decision as governor, you know, um, school districts, you must open for school in 2020. We said you got to do it. And the results are, you see the results, not just in the, the kids' scores. I mean, there is families that moved to Florida because they couldn't even access appropriate education in other places that they were at. We also took a stand, not just about having the economy open, not just about having kids in school, which are obviously very important, but we took a very strong stand uh, for individual rights. We were not going to let them impose things like vaccine passports in this state. And we were not going to let them impose vaccine mandates, whether employer, employee. And because we understood from the very beginning uh, what they were trying to do by impose these mandates, it was not about science. It was about forcing compliance. That is why they were doing it. And if you think about like a vaccine passport, you know, the people that are uh, against me in this election, they wanted vaccine passports in the state of Florida. Uh, they wanted you to have to, if you're going to go to a restaurant or if you're going to go to a government building or something, you have to show your booster shots and, and show your, your back schedule for COVID. And that would create basically a two-tiered society where people who, and, and oh, by the way, as they were doing that, 
uh, they did not recognize natural immunity through prior infection. So you could have had COVID and then said, well, why do I need, why would I want to do that? I've already had it. You know, I have the immunity built up. The pr and they still wouldn't have, have recognized that. So basically, that decision was going to be, can you participate fully in society or not? And that had no place in Florida. So not only did we not do any of those, we banned man uh, vaccine passports writ large. No government, no business, no passports, period. Japan joint meeting. We're honored to be joined by the Japanese ambassador to the United States, Koji Tamita, who's right here. Thank you. He has uh, written books on both Winston Churchill and Margaret Thatcher. And there's a lot of people in the Southeast U.S. who like Winston Churchill and Margaret Thatcher. I can tell you that. So we're honored to have him. Also, Kajihiro Nakai, Consul General of Japan in Miami, has been to Tallahassee. We've been able to visit with him. Really appreciate uh, his support. Uh, Mio uh, Meida, General Counsel of Japan in Atlanta, is here. Thank you so much. Um, Yuichi Matsu, uh, Matsumoto, Consul General of Japan in Nashville, thank you for, for being here. Uh, Nobuhito Sasaki, the chairman of Jetro, thank you, sir, for being here. And Masaki Suya, as you know, uh, Bridgestone Corporation. I think most Americans have heard of Bridgestone Tires and Corporations, and I can tell you a lot of golfers have heard of Bridgestone <laughs> Golf Balls because they're doing a very good job with the golf balls. And even that's the golf ball that Tiger Woods uses. So you know that they're doing something right. So we really appreciate uh, everybody who's come together to make this uh, conference possible. I also just want to say, and I know this, this happened uh, earlier in the year and we had expressed condolences at the time, but uh, you know, we were really saddened to see the death of Shinzo Abe uh, here in the state of Florida because he was somebody who was a stalwart ally of the United States of America. He was a true friend to the American people and he was one great leader for the people of Japan. So we're now here with a lot of Japanese. We extend our condolences for a really, really great loss of a really great man. We're also uh, excited, though, about the U.S.-Japan alliance, the relationship. Yes, Southeast U.S., but, but as a whole, we just have to understand we have threats uh, in this world to free societies. And if you look at the Asia-Pacific region, you know, the number one challenge that free people have to deal with is the rise of China and the Chinese Communist Party. And if you look at, at those threats, there's no way those can be managed without a strong Japan and a strong United States relationship. And so we very much as Americans appreciate uh, Japan's role in being a real leader in the Asia Pacific region. If you wanna know what's uh, the problems in the Asia Pacific, a lot of people can see those. You wanna know what's right about Asia Pacific, Japan is what's right about the Asia Pacific region. So we thank you for that. We also are proud of being able to offer really great opportunities to continue our economic ties with the people of Japan. You look at the Southeast United States, there's an unmistakable trend in the United States of America for people uprooting, voting with their feet, leaving jurisdictions in other parts of our country, and not only bringing their, their individuals, their families, their talent, but a lot, a lot of wealth to states in the Southeastern United States. And there's a long uh, long list of reasons for that. It's not something that happened just overnight, but I think it's really accelerated over the last few years, particularly in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. We saw too many states in our country uh, lock people down, grind them down, keep kids out of school, make it impossible to do business, impose uh, arbitrary mandates. And the places where we trusted people to make decisions, where we protected people's rights to be able to work and do business, and we ensured our kids could be in school in person very early on, uh, you know, that paid big dividends because people wanted to be in areas where their rights were respected, where their decisions were respected. And we had a number of businesses migrate within the United States to come to the state of Florida. I mean, uh, Fauci, he hated the restaurants. He was always complaining that Florida had restaurants open. But you know what happened? A lot of these restaurants couldn't operate in some of these places effectively in our own country because of these restrictions. 
So they set up shop in Florida. These are like great places. I was telling the guys earlier, you have these unbelievable Japanese sushi chefs are now in Florida doing like really, really great things. You have like, they bring in this Kobe beef, unbelievable what's going on. And so you see our hospitality, our leisure, our restaurant has boomed um, in the last few years in ways that nobody thought possible. And in fact, people thought with COVID that Florida was gonna end up doing, the, the tourism was gonna stop, uh, our, our economy was gonna crater. And actually it ended up being just the opposite in 2021. Florida set a record for domestic tourism. We were the number one destination for other Americans to travel to by a country mile. And in 2021, if you look at all foreign tourism to the United States of America as a whole, almost 45% of all foreign tourism to America was right here in the state of Florida. We've never had one state take up so much uh, of the tourism market as we did in 2020. And a lot of it was because People knew that this was the free state of Florida. They knew that they could come here. They knew that they could enjoy themselves. And so if you look at 2020, particularly when COVID hit, we had $24 billion of adjusted gross income move from other states into the state of Florida. And if you look at the states that hemorrhaged that adjusted gross income, New York, Illinois, California, tens of billions of dollars leaving these other Southeast states, like, like Georgia, uh, South Carolina, they are also getting Tennessee, Nashville, unbelievable uh, what's going on. And so these trends are just unmistakable. And so if you want to be in a place where you can do well in the United States in terms of future investment or expanding existing, existing investment, you've got to look to the Southeast United States because this is these trends are strong. Uh, these trends are, are, are not going to change anytime soon. And, you know, there's a lot of reasons for that. I and mean, I think we're very proud of our uh, tax environment. We do not have an income tax in the state of Florida. Uh, we have a very low uh, corporate income tax as well, at least compared to our, our major competitors in some of the big states. We want people to do well in Florida. We want you to be, if you start, so start a business, we're number one in the nation in new business formations. Uh, for many years now, even though we're half the size of California and they're supposed to be the internet startup capital, we have way more business formations in Florida with 22 million people than they do in California with 40 million people. And I think part of it is you actually, people feel like they, they want, the state wants them to succeed, that they actually want to see them do well. And I've had people move businesses from some of these other states and they feel like these other states are just trying to stack the deck against them and treating them as almost like they're an enemy just because they're trying to do well uh, with a small business or a medium-sized business. And so our mentality is, you know, we believe attracting uh, more economic opportunity is good for our state. If you look at our unemployment, I mean, we've added jobs. We added jobs this past month, even though we had a category four plus hurricane hit at the end of September, October, we still added, I think, 30, 35,000 private sector jobs in the state of Florida, and our unemployment rate is one of the lowest that we've ever had in our history. And so you see that our labor force is expanding here in Florida, and I know this is true with a lot of the other Southeast United States, and so we're really the place to be, I think, this region of the country. Uh, I would say that if you look at the state of Florida, one of the things that we're doing is good or better than anyone is space. And I know some of you have been able to go to Kennedy Space Center and check that out. I can tell you, if you go back 10 years, they had retired the space shuttle. NASA was basically on the mat. It was a time of real, real serious despair in that industry. But you've had really, really major private sector investment. You have some of the greatest companies now, like Elon Musk, SpaceX, and many others. A lot of the major defense companies are there. And you've seen massive, massive growth, massive, massive opportunity. So that's something that we're really proud of. Uh, and we know that, that that Kennedy Space Center is the top, um, or certainly one of the top hubs for space in the entire world. And so we're gonna continue uh, to do that. Uh, we're also very proud of, of being a great tourist destination. We would like to see expansion of flights uh, direct from Florida to Japan and vice versa. 
I mean, I think that this is a, a great place. I think a lot of a lot of Japanese people would really love to come and visit Florida. Of course, this part of Florida, you know, there's a lot of attractions. But I think what people have found out, particularly over the last couple of years, is man, there are so many other great spots uh, that you can be in the state of Florida that we're really, really proud of. And yes, Miami gets a lot of attention and it's attracted people from all over the world. That is really the capital uh, of Latin America um, in this hemisphere. Uh, but if you look at it, you go down, you go west, you go to the Tampa Bay area, never been doing better. You go to some of these places in Southwest Florida. I mean, you saw the hurricane, but you know, what, what I would tell people is, you know, when this debris is picked up, this place is gonna come back better. Um, if you look at just a beautiful piece of land, and these are really good people. So that area is gonna boom uh, again, and, and you, can, you can mark that down. You also look at places like the Northwest Florida and the Panhandle. In fact, some of these guys are gonna end up living in the Panhandle, they were telling me at some point, <laughs> because it draws people from all across the Southeast. In fact, I remember this summer of 2020, like June, July, you know, there were not a lot of places you could even go to and be normal. And so you go to the Panhandle in Florida, you see Texas plates, Louisiana, Alabama, Mississippi, Tennessee, Georgia. So they just all converge on 30A and on these other places uh, throughout Northwest Florida. And so they had the best summer they have ever had in 2020 summer when COVID was you know, something that was causing some people to not want to do stuff. So, so we're proud of all of that. I think there's a lot of great things that we can do working uh, with Japan. And we're very, very uh, impressed uh, with Japanese business, Japanese economy, uh, Japanese commitment uh, to, to core values that America holds dear. And we're very grateful for, for the great alliance that, that this country has uh, with, with not only uh, the government of Japan, but the people of Japan. So welcome. We're happy that you're here. We look forward to being able to expand our ties in all of our states and certainly in the state of Florida. You, know, you name it, you got interest in, in investing here, let us know. We're gonna, we'll, we'll make it worth your while because we think that this is a great place to be, as are some of our other states in the southeastern United States. So thank you for being here and we look forward to working with you throughout this conference. God bless you all. Yeah wanted to make sure we were empowering individuals with the ability to make these decisions. And, you know, part of uh, this issue and other issues with COVID, um, you know, goes back to an attempt to uh, enforce one acceptable narrative on, on all these issues. And, you know, you saw it with uh, the uh, censorship of, of Dr. Bhattacharya uh, with Twitter. You also saw it with Dr. Fauci and some of these people saying, that they needed to go after these people who wrote the Great Barrington Declaration. They wanted to not contest the ideas in that. They basically wanted to, to smear them uh, because they didn't want to have any criticism uh, of their lockdown policies. And so part of the reason I think it's been a bad response is because from the very beginning, you've had a lot of arrogance that it's our way or the highway and anyone that offers any type of a dissenting opinion. And they were censoring from day one. People that would write anti-lockdown uh, things in March of 2020, April 2020, some of those would get taken down off some of these big tech platforms. And so we saw that over and over again. And I think that uh, ultimately, uh, you know, your policies or your positions or your analysis of this medical science should stand on its own. And if, it, if it's not able to accept criticism, if you can't defend the policy against, against valid criticism, uh, then maybe you need to be looking in the mirror. But that's not what these elites wanted to do. They wanted to just cocoon themselves from any criticism and to try to denigrate anybody uh, that had a different way of thinking. So I think with the Twitter, what Elon Musk is doing, I think there's going to be a lot more that comes out with that.